I exalt your name, I lift you high, Lord. Oh, 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 yeah. I lift you high, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We exalt your name, you were higher than the your name is exalted above all the earth. We lift you high, Lord, yeah. Oh, oh, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. All right, somebody say praise the Lord. Oh, we love Jesus today. Avery loves Jesus too. She's trying to say amen, but she's still learning the language. It's okay, Avery, we understand what you're trying to say. You're trying to say amen. I got an amen corner in Avery right there. Give her a steak, come on. All right, this Saturday, Men of War, you do not want to miss that. And uh, before we get started, let's pray for those that are currently ill. And um, that's, that's an entire other thing in its own. I'll have to not say it online. I'll just text you guys individually. But um, let's pray that God would touch our sick brothers and sisters and uh, strengthen them during uh, their time of sickness. I, I hate getting sick. I also love getting sick. Getting sick reminds me I'm human and my dependency on God and his strength. But, you know, if I can learn without getting sick, then that's kind of my best. <laughs> but hallelujah. Let's help our brothers and sisters with some prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters. We love them, Jesus. We're praying that your goodness would touch their bodies, God. They are sick in their beds. They're sick, God, physically with pain and ailment. And God, your scripture teaches us to pray and to believe and to trust your word. And so by the authority of your mighty name, Jesus, we pray that you would release healing virtue into their bodies right now. As they watch this service, as they tune in, I pray that they can feel the power of the Holy Ghost touch their bodies. We trust you, God. We know that you know no limitation, God. You can perform this miracle right now. Just as the centurion said, speak the word only, Lord, and we can see that miracle take place, God. We pray that you would bless our time together in this Bible study. I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that this particular topic would really open our eyes to the chapters of history that we're living. And we pray this by the authority of your mighty name. And everybody said amen. Okay, we are going to jump right into this. This is Becoming Christ-like, part 27. And uh, 27 weeks of learning about Jesus. That's an accomplishment, okay? And uh, everybody say, I love Jesus. That's why you're here learning about him. I want to begin with a short introduction today about this subject because the world is changing faster than I think any of us anticipated. Uh, we're hearing and seeing things change locally as well as globally. It began with a mask. It's now a vaccine. And eventually, uh, there will be a mark that awaits every human in the world. Some of us reluctantly, but eventually, put a mask on. And we did it in order 
to attempt to return to our perception of a normal life. We didn't want to lose our Costco rights. And so we put masks on reluctantly. We wore them at the bottom of our face, but they still got them on our faces. And uh, so we, we stood, and at the same time, we bowed. So it was a very interesting time to, for us in history. This is how it began. It's just a mask. That's all it is. It's just a mask. From it's just a mask, it graduated to it's science. Stop fighting it. Then from there it went to, if you don't think about it, it makes sense. Then they jump to think about others, do what's right. And if positive reinforcement did not work, then began the demonization. You're an anti-masker, you Trump supporter. You are selfish. You don't care about others. My favorite was when they walked up to me at a Fred Meyer and some hippie-looking dude with pants so tight that his head was about to pop, yells at me and says, you murderer! I wanted to breathe on him. But I did my best to be a Christian in the moment. This is what we're facing. It's just the beginning. You may be wondering, what does any of this have to do with becoming Christ-like? Well, the world wants to make you conform to their logic. The world wants to make you conform to their rules. And eventually, the world wants to convince you or force you to bow your knee to their antichrist. So tonight, we are going to talk about what Jesus said and what Jesus injected into his disciples because here's the real picture. Fox won't tell you this, and neither will Newsmax. Hallelujah. The world is the virus. Jesus is the great physician. And the truth is our vaccination. And so today, by the grace of God, we are going to see what Jesus says about this. And believe it or not, it's a, it's a very small amount of verses in the text of Matthew 16 but we're going to throw some in there to kind of see how this all plays together and will all play a part in the end times. Matthew 16 and 24, if you'll turn there tonight. This is, oh, here's another thing, and I'll say it publicly because I'm already getting text messages from my uncle who is in the Air Force at Fairchild, and uh, he sent me the uh, religious exception. You can get an exemption from the vaccine. Um, I can sign it. Put our church information on there. And up to this point, they still have to honor religious exemptions. And so we still have a way to say no to the jab, dab. Praise God. And so there's still, there's still some things we got. It may not always be there, but so far, we got something. Everybody said amen. amen. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're going to break this verse down because this is end time revelation. Jesus, who already knows that the disciples are going to go through specific things, vaccinates them from what society is about to do to them by letting them know this is how you survive. He begins with, if any man will come after me. Now, what does this come after me mean? Is this talking about just discipleship, just following him from Galilee uh, to Samaria? Or is Jesus leading them somewhere bigger and better? According to the book of John 14 and 2, 
Jesus gives them a glimpse of what he means here in Matthew 16 by saying, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may also be. And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. So Jesus informs them, hey, just a heads up. This started off as a journey that you guys took to leave the world and leave your jobs and leave society and leave those principles and leave your religion. It started off as something visible, but the journey is actually about to transcend into the invisible. Because the reality is, is, is where I want to take you is heaven. And what I've made for you is better than anywhere I can take you on earth. And so this is why the Apostle Paul goes all the way back through these texts as these stories are being shared. And under the unction of the Holy Ghost, he says in 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Amen. Now, Paul said, I hasn't seen it, but he spoke a little bit too soon. His eyes hadn't seen it, but John the Revelator got a glimpse. In Revelation 21 and 2, the Bible says, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he may dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. So God says, I've prepared a place for you, physical. I've prepared mansions for you, physical. I've prepared streets of gold for you, physical. But I've also, pre I've also prepared an environment where everything that stunk about the world is wiped away. Where you no longer have to bury the people you love and you no, lo you no longer have to wake up and take a medicine because you're in pain. And you no longer, you're never going to know what it feels like again to cry because you're burying beautiful people or you're seeing people get leukemia or you're seeing people die before their time. He said, I've created an environment that is so much better. And so when Jesus said, if you're going to come after me. This is what he's talking about. He literally is trying to teach us, if you're really going to come after me, you're going to have to be willing to follow me to heaven, but on the way to heaven, you may have to go through hell. Amen. Jesus is the prototype. This is why the Bible says that he went to hell and got the keys. Because part of going to heaven means we may have to go through hell. But if hell is the cost for heaven, it's worth going through it. You're going to see how it all ties into the end times here. What is the first requirement that Jesus gives the disciples to get to heaven, to follow him? He says, let him deny himself. Self-denial is the first dimension of Christianity. Self-denial is just welcome to the party. Self-denial is just you about to learn some things. You know what self-denial is? Telling yourself no. Notice how it doesn't say, he that comes after me, I'm going to deny everything. Hey, can I tell you something? Until you learn to tell yourself no, none of this works. Self-denial is a revelation. Hey, can I tell you, if you don't self-deny yourself the things that will keep you out of hell, you don't, you're not going to have to self-deny them. They're not available in hell. So it's illogical to continue to hold on to things 
that'll keep you out of heaven and send you to hell when either you deny yourself those things or God will deny them for you in eternity. But either way, whether you believe it or not, you will not be a drunkard forever. You may be labeled a drunkard because that's what you were your whole life. But you will not have access to drinking that drink and you will be burning in the lake of fire. And what you could not give up on your own will on earth, God says, don't worry, I'll help you forever. Somebody say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that either. Self-denial is fundamental to living for God. Telling yourself no. The, you know, even Paul understood this. All things are lawful, not all things are expedient. But I will be brought under subjection to none of these things. That's why I go through my kombucha, my coffee, my tea, my water. I go through my phases. Because the moment I feel like I'm addicted to something, I go, okay, I got to give it up. Pastor, that just sounds ridiculous. It's ridiculous if you're not practicing self-denial. It's intelligent if you realize my flesh likes this stuff. In fact, my flesh can go from liking to loving. And then my flesh can go from loving to not willing to give up. So I would rather self-deny myself and self-regulate these things so that God doesn't have to cause a trial in my life to get me to leave them. What did Jesus say about the people that don't like rules, laws, and boundaries or self-denial? Matthew 7, 23, brother, can you show them what Jesus said about this type of personality? And this is the personality that is all over the United States right now, all over the world, all over Western civilization, probably everywhere. But essentially, Jesus says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You know one of the fastest ways to overcome iniquity? Self-denial. Because you tell yourself, you will not do that. You will not go there. You will not talk like that. You will not act like that. You will not dress like that. You will not think like that. You will not do these things. Why? I'm denying myself worldly and fleshly lusts that I know are bad for me. So I have to ask you a question today because I'm a spiritual practitioner, and this is actually part of being a pastor. Take inventory in your life today. Do you take advantage of all things are lawful to the point where you do anything you want? And then you justify it under the umbrella of grace so that you're pre-programming your flesh to be stronger than your spirit. Or can you actually look at your inventory and say, you know something? I really do deny myself a lot of the things that I really want to do. Because I know what it feels like. So someone open their mouth and me be like, Lord, I know what I want to say. <laughs> Self-denial, have your way. Self-denial is a part of Christianity. Somebody said amen. amen. It is impossible. Everybody say impossible. impossible. It is impossible to follow Jesus without self-denial. Because you cannot follow someone when you're so focused on yourself. What do I think? What do I feel? What do I want? What, what, what? Hey, can I tell you? Follow the leader. He's the one going to heaven. It's impossible to follow Jesus Christ without self-denial because Jesus demands self-denial. For you to not do self-denial and then demand heaven and God give you that would make him a liar. So, it is impossible to be a true Christian without self-denial because the very founder of Christianity, Jesus himself, denied himself everything he could have had outside the will of God. He denied himself everything he could have even though he had the power to have it. Command these stones become bread, self-denial. All these things will I give to thee, self-denial. Jesus 
people wonder, how come Jesus was so anointed, so powerful? You know why? The reason was is because he denied him his flesh so much that the water couldn't figure out, is this a fleshly man or is this God walking on water? You can deny yourself to the point where even nature itself cannot tell if you're in the spirit or in the flesh. That's what Jesus did. Now, let me just... Let me make sure I clarify this, because there's some people that believe, well, I guess Christianity is all about what we don't do. We don't do this, and we don't do that, and we don't go there, and we don't. Hey, that's part A of Christianity. There's also the other part, which is it's not just what you don't do. It's also what you do do that saves us. It's also what you do do that makes us Christians, because Jesus after self-denial said, now that you've been able to self-deny yourself, I want you to pick up the cross and follow. Everybody say CrossFit. Who's done CrossFit before? Anybody done CrossFit before? You like you the CrossFit? Did they put you on a special diet? No? <laughs> nice. CrossFit is what God is trying to get us to. But in order to be cross fit, in order to be fit to carry your cross, it's going to take abstaining from things that take away your strength to carry it. Listen, folks, this is logical. I thank God that my trainer is no longer on the north side because if he was, he would be going, you need a lot of self-denial right now. <laughs> But can I tell you, I know that when the, how many people here have denied themselves certain foods and then you get stronger when you, and you get healthier and you get, anybody done that before? Okay, glad you realize that nature itself preaches to us. And so here Jesus is saying, you ain't never going to pick up your cross until you deny yourself because the cross is too heavy if you're still carrying all the other stuff, you won't deny yourself. But the cross is bearable when you put down the stuff that God doesn't want you to have. Somebody say, help us, Lord. Jesus is using language that should have stirred fear into his disciples. The word cross there is the historical reference for the literal nightmare of every enemy of Rome. The word cross there was used to put fear into the hearts of the people who did not agree with the United States, I mean, Roman government. It was used to put fear in them in order to get them to get quiet, to get docile, and to become puppets. Hey, did you know that Judaism in its prime compromised? There are a bunch of puppets to Rome. They bowed, Caiaphas, all these cowards bowed to Rome, tried to appease Rome, tried to be okay with Rome, tried to be friends with Rome. In fact, read the book of, the book of Matthew. They were all troubled that there was a new Messiah coming because they were all comfortable with their current government. They let us have a temple. They let us have church. They let us gather they let us have our own religious thing. They let us have our own pastors, high priests. They let us have all of this stuff. Why do we, we need our Messiah right now? And yet, what we're seeing right now is history repeat itself. Because the American church sure does love its America. And God's going, you like it because it caters to your flesh. You like it because you don't have to sacrifice. You like it because you guys practice indulgence, not self-denial. You like it because your form of Christianity doesn't have a cross. Our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world that are really going through it, they convict me. Because I'm like, dude, my dudes are like going through it. And I'm over here like, can I get a double shot latte, please, so I can read my Bible because I'm tired? I'm preaching better than you're responding, but okay, praise God. Why is Jesus saying that in order to come after him, you must carry your cross? Because Jesus is warning his disciples. This is actually, believe it or not, 
This is a form of SEAL boot camp training. At SEAL camp, they try to scare you away. You understand that, right? They have a bell, and their job is to drown you, mess you up, work you out, and, and they want to sift you. So they want you to walk over to the bell, and they want you to ring the bell and say, I can't be a SEAL. I'll go back to the Marines. I'll go back to the Air Force. I'll go back. I'll go do that, but I can't be a SEAL. Jesus is telling his disciples, okay, all of Judaism is trying to avoid the cross. Jesus is saying, y'all going to pick up a cross. In other words, think of your greatest nightmare, brother. Think of your greatest nightmare, sister. And God is saying, if you're not willing to face your greatest fears, you'll never make it to heaven. That's pretty sobering if you ask me. In other words, what God is trying to say is, hey, just a heads up, devils, governments will use every type of fear tactic to convince you to not follow after Jesus. They'll use the fear of a virus to keep you out of church. They'll use the fear of a virus to steal your job. They'll use the fear of a virus to, uh, 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 to lose your assets. And then they'll amplify it and say, no, 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 it's not just your assets, it's not just your church, it's not just your job, but you'll actually lose your life. You don't want to lose your life. So be afraid and trust us. Don't carry your cross. It's too dangerous. Somebody say, help us, Lord. Brothers and sisters, we are going to have to face some of our greatest fears if we're going to be able to make it into heaven and if we're going to make heaven our home. In other words, every one of us has fears. Can you imagine the fear of a mother, Sister Paige? Do you think she wants to see her children persecuted? I spoke to somebody today that told me, you know what my greatest fear is? Is seeing my children starve to death. And I thought to myself, you know what my greatest fear is? Your children going to hell. Death is temporary if they're saved, but it's eternal if they're not. And the world is phenomenal at what it does because it has the church up against the ropes. And the church is trying to figure out, do we comply? What do we do? Do we this? Do we that? But Jesus is telling us, here's a reality check. Do you want heaven or not? Do you want the cross or not? Somebody say, help us, Jesus. Then he amplifies this example in verse 25. Look what he says here. He says, for whosoever will save his life, everybody say save, shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my name's sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world, lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Here is a kingdom principle that Jesus reveals to us. It's upside down. In the kingdom, when it comes to Jesus, if you're trying to save your life and your life is more important than Jesus, then you lose. But if you lose your life, because your life is not as valuable as Jesus, then you find it. Now, for us, it sounds poetic. Christianity is a great idea, and so you have to live it. It's what I always tell people. It's so awesome. Christianity is so awesome when you're like, you slap someone, you say, turn the other cheek until someone slaps you back, and you're like, turn the other cheek. It's great theory until you have to live it. Could it be... Could it be, follow me for a second, could it be that God gave us an open door, an open assessment, an open physical, some blood pressure, some cardiovascular work, maybe some neurological studies to let us know where we're really at? And here we are in 2021, I believe, is the year we're living in right now. Don't even... I, for some reason, I think back, we're, we're in 1985, but praise God. 
We're, hallelujah. And here we're having people hyper-focused on saving their life. But they're not hyper-focused on saving the lives of the lost. It's fascinating to see the psychological warfare that's taking place and how casual the church is taking it. Somebody say, help us, Jesus. Here's something Jesus is trying to teach us. Life isn't worth saving if it's going to cost you your soul. Everything in, everything in life, in contrast, is worth losing if you find salvation. That's the math there. Now, here is the question you need to ask yourself. What is your life? What makes your life your life? What is it? The conveniences? Is it the things you like, the friends you have, the family members you do, the voices in your life, the music you listen to, uh, the fashion you subscribe to, the emotions and the ideologies you adopt? What is your life? Because whatever your life is composed of, Jesus is saying that you have to be willing to lose it. Because if you're not willing to lose it, you will be lost. So it's like a, everybody say lose-lose. It's a lose-lose proposition there. Okay? Here's something else that's interesting about this. If you're going to make, your, if you're going to make heaven your home, you have to be willing to lose. What does that mean? What are you willing to lose to get into heaven? Are you willing to lose the attitude? Are you willing to lose the fear? Fear does not get into heaven, according to Revelation 21, 7 and 8. But the fearful and unbelieving. Notice how they're right next to each other. You know why they're right next to each other? Because fearfulness is rooted in unbelieving. So here's the dilemma. What are you willing to lose to get in? Are you willing to lose money? Are you willing to lose health? Are you willing to lose? What are you willing to lose? Friendships, relationships, attitudes, bitterness, personal opinions, vindictives. What are you willing to lose to get to heaven? Because you've got to be willing to lose to get in. And here's the other thing. What you count as lost, Paul said, was dung. So really, it's not even, it's actually a win-win. Because the stuff you lose was keeping you out. And so you, you get rid of the dung and you get heaven. It's a win-win. Everybody say, help us, Lord. It's not gain if you lose what really matters. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? It's not gain if you lose what really matters. Do you understand that? What really matters at the end of this thing, at, at, at the end of the vaccine, the mark, all this nonsense, at the end of the day, it's not gain if you've lost your soul. It's not gain if your name's not in the Lamb's book of life. It's not gain if God says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. It's not gain, it's a loss. And you have to switch your thinking so that you can stop letting the world tell you that you're losing things. I ain't losing anything. I'm gaining everything. Because what you got cannot... I'm trying to help you understand what the world's trying to convince you of. The world beats this into your brains and you start going, well, we're going to lose this and we're going to lose that. Are you? You may be winning. Can I just say this? This is a reality because this message, when I was in prayer, God was like, just watch their faces. You'll see. You see, it's easy to talk about this theoretically because they're not knocking on our doors right now because they're not hunting us down right now because we haven't lost our jobs yet because we haven't lost our wealth yet. 
because they haven't shut down our bank accounts yet because they haven't crucified any of us yet. It's, it's theoretically, I can preach this and teach this, and everyone nods their head. That's right. That's the way it is. Come on, preach about it. That's the truth. Come on. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Come on, I won't bow. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Come on, I got the faith. I'm like Daniel. If they tell me I can't pray, I'll tell you I'll walk into the lions. Then I can't get you to pre-service prayer. Lions den. I got lions den people that I'm like, I wish you prayed for five minutes. See, this stuff is theoretically awesome. Christianity is theoretically, man, that is an awesome Jesus way to go until it's tested. And you know what I love about Jesus? He does little tests, tiny tests. I mean, for me, they're pretty big tests. Like, hey, Aren't you one of his disciples? No. Hey, aren't you one of his? No. Hey, aren't you one of his disciples? Bleep, bleep, bleep. He does little tests. That, that, that little test was showing Peter, hey, Peter, if the mark of the beast knocked on your door, you would have took it. Because you weren't willing to give up your life. So God does little test, little self-denial test along your walk with him to see if you'll pass the final test. And see, I, I, Brother Matt, I didn't understand this. I did not understand. See, this is why I love the holiness apostolic movement, because they do all kinds of little weird things that I love. And you know why I love them? Because they're little tests to see if I really love the world that much. There are little tests that will check my spirit, check my attitude, check the way I, check, check if I'm willing to submit to something. Yeah. And you know something? I remember I used to argue with, I used to argue with some pretty smart guys, and I used to, I, I used to, I, we used to, what, what, I call it, uh, what do you call it when it's, uh, you can't move anymore, it's in chess, it's stalemate. I used to argue some of the stuff so good, Sister Paige, that it was a stalemate. And you know what the Holy Ghost told me? What if it does matter? I, I defended clothes in such a way that the other guy couldn't defend it. It was like stalemate. He was like, good, yeah, good job. And then the Holy Ghost was like, what about the parable of the man in the kingdom that was thrown out because he refused to put the garment on? And I said, ooh, I must have overlooked that one, God. And God said, what if I do have a dress code in the kingdom? And I started going, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, I didn't tell my friend that because I didn't want him to use that against me. You know what I'm saying? I was trying to justify my rebellion for a while. You know what I mean? And so I was like, he don't know that verse because he probably don't study the Bible. So that's okay. I'm going to hold on to this. But conviction started getting on me. And I started thinking to myself, what if it does matter? What if this is something God looks for? Why am I holding on to it so much? Why can't I deny myself these simple things? But then I tell myself that one day I will sacrifice my life for Christ. Really? You can't do the little things. Doesn't the scripture say this? He that is faithful in the... Is sacrificing your life little? That's much. Sacrificing little things about your life is little. And so the scripture is prophesying, if you're not willing to be faithful in the little things, I do not expect you to give your life up for me. Not happening. We need to master saying no to, to ourselves. We need to master saying no to the world, no to Satan, and we've got to learn to say yes, Lord, to God. Sister, you were sharing with me today in Bible study that someone thinks you're in a cult. I'm glad they think you're in a cult. And I'm glad the way you responded. They told our beautiful sister here, Patricia, they told her, one of her friends told her, you're in a cult, I'm worried about you. Those people are telling you what you're supposed to do. And she responded and said, no. My father's been telling me what to do. 
Hey, I don't know about nobody else. What do you do to that? You're like, well, <laughs> snap. But you know what's amazing? The same people that will tell you you're in a cult behave like they're running a cult. You better do this or else. And we're the cult. <laughs> My goodness, can you imagine? It blows me away. I was talking to the Lord this morning in prayer, and I said, God, I know that you're winking at our ignorance right now because it is the most hilarious thing to see the world say, you cannot buy, sell, or trade, and you cannot come into our stores without the vaccine. But then I get up and say, except the man is born again of water and spirit, and they go, he's judgmental. <laughs> Do you see how dumb that sounds? The world has a double standard. God has a single standard. God's like, this is just how it really is. Everybody say, I love him. Now watch this. God instructs us to be CrossFit because he knows that one day, if he tarries, we will have to handle some of the greatest weights of all. Revelation 13 and 16, if you want to know why this is being tied in, it's perfect timing the way God put us in this lesson. Look at this. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads. That's, that's, that's the risk there. The powers that be, the government, the devil, Satan, the Antichrist, one world, whatever, you fill in the blank. I'm not trying to get theological with you. I'm trying to get practical with you for you to understand that there's going to come a day where every human in earth will be tested. And the Bible says this is how he amplifies the test, that no man might buy, sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, I am convinced that the vaccine is not the mark. The, ma the mask was not the mark either. There was actually some people that were like, I'm telling you the mask is the mark, and I'm like, that is not in the Bible. <laughs> Folks, that was a test. And the world failed. Here's the next test. And you know what? I have a, I have a, I have a pretty good feeling the world's going to fail again. But I don't expect the world to pass. And then the mark's going to come. And I expect the world to fail again. But do you know who I expect to pass? The church. I expect those that have been denying themselves their whole lives in preparation for this test to say, we were never promised a crossless Christianity. We were never promised a beautiful exit. God never once promised any of us that there would not be persecution. He never promised us that there would not be pain or sorrow or suffering. He just promised us he'd be with us and he has a better place for us. But this is the dilemma that the church is facing right now. 14 and 9 of Revelation. You remember what the scripture says? He that finds his life shall lose it. He that loses his life shall find it. Well, part of life is buying and selling. And so the guys that take the mark think, hey, we saved our lives. We're about to find out if that's the case. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast of his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels 
and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest, nor day, nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. These people are going to think they saved their life. Hey, I can go to the store now. I can live again. I can eat. I can drink water. I can go to the, I, I can go to the bars again. I can go to Costco again. Hey, my life, I saved my life. I saved my kids' life. I saved everyone's life. I did a good thing. And God says, you don't even know what you did when you took that mark. When you took that mark, you made yourself my enemy. When you took that mark, the Bible says they shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. You know what the scripture says in the book of Hebrews? It says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Anger and wrath are two different things. God is saying, oh, now you really made me mad. And he prophesied that those people would spend eternity in the lake of fire. So the question I ask you tonight is, did they save their life? Yes. Did they lose their soul? Yes. Now look at the Christians. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. You ready? Look at this. Revelation 20 and 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. How many people are ready to lose their head for Jesus? Well, I'm glad you guys are honest, because I wasn't going to lift up my hands either. Not exactly what I'm looking forward to, but it may be necessary. Not just for the witness of Jesus, but for the word of God. Hey, this is why I really believe, Sister Paige. I actually told someone yesterday that when I start signing all of these religious exemptions for the vaccine, um, I'm putting my, I'm putting my, <laughs> I'm writing my own death certificate. <laughs> because eventually they're going to say, we've got to stop religious exemptions and we've got to stop these pastors that stand. See, they're not going to go after the pastors that compromise. They're going to go after the pastors that stand. And so if a guy stands on the word of God, they're coming after him. Jesus is letting us know. You preach male, female. You preach the principles of God. You preach against sin. You preach against the Antichrist. You preach against this world government. You preach this stuff. Guess what's going to happen? Oh, they're coming after us. Hey, I'm not saying it. This is what the scripture is saying. For the word of God. And, they, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads and in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Here's what's amazing about this. If we do not have this revelation and if we are not practicing this heads up that God gave us thousands of years ago, we are going to be faced with a decision that is not just life and death, it is eternal defining. And we've got to be ready for that. We've got to be ready, literally, and listen, I don't know how you prepare for this stuff, okay, because I'm not a dad and I'm not a mom. I don't know how you prepare for the idea of seeing your children suffer. I don't know how you prepare for the idea of seeing a spouse suffer. I, I do not know, so I am not here to preach it like it's an easy thing. I'm not here to do that. I'm here to let you know that God gave us a very timely heads up a long time ago that the day may come where we are presented with life and death, heaven and hell, and a mark makes difference. And the church must not fail that Test. You're wondering, do I stand against the vaccine? I'm not anti-vaccine, guys. 
Some vaccines work. I'm anti-pilots that have never flown planes. Hey, I'm anti-being the test dummy on a new car that they're going to ram into a wall. So I'm sorry. I'm anti-taking something that I don't have data to let me know it's okay, especially when behind it there's something that resembles the mark of the beast. Does that mean if you do it, you're going to hell? Highly doubt it. You may get sick. You may not get sick. I don't know what's going to happen to you. That's between you, your doctors, God, your bodies. Y'all figure it out. You see how we're not a cult here? Your body, your choice. <laughs> I'm not here to tell you what to do or what not to do. So let me clarify that. What I am here to tell you is if you're going to take it, number one, you better pray. Number two, I would suggest you fast. Number three, I would suggest you recite the scripture about the deadly poisons because that's exactly what's going into you. And number four, you better make a conscious decision that this is not your first step to the mark, but it's your last compromise before the mark. Because at some point you have to draw a line. And every one of you have to make that decision. I can't make that decision for you. Because guess what? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You have to decide that. So no, our church is not anti-vax. Our church is not anti any of that stuff. We're for God, for the ways of God, for the ways of God, for the word of God. We're for worshiping God, not a government, not beast, not any of that stuff. We're for, the, we're for God. And that's who we are as a church. Amen? Would you stand with me tonight? Really want us to pray for some specific things. God knows what we're up against, folks. So just in case you're wondering, God knows. Here are some things that I think our church needs to pray about as we're entering this season because um, we're getting ready to start. I'm, I'm seeing all of the emails. My uncle's in the Air Force. We got the email that they wanted to mandate vaccines inside of the military, and they wanted to. Luckily for the Marines, they got some courage. They said no. But the other departments seem to be folding like flies. So, but the Marines seem to be standing. Well, that's good news. But it doesn't mean it's going to stop anything. Our governor's as liberal as it gets, which means the church will start facing persecution as we start exercising religious exemptions. The fear-mongering will continue to grow. They're going to continue to threaten us, take away rights, etc. Here's, here's the thing. We need strength. Because it's not going to be easy, folks. It's not going to be easy. So we need to pray for strength. We also need to pray for revelation because in order for us to stand, we need to know what we're standing for. We need to pray for endurance because we don't know how long this is going to go. We need to pray for courage because it's easy to be fearful and not be courageous. We need to pray for love to know what we're living for and potentially dying for. And we need to pray that whatever it takes, that God does not let us lose our soul. Because at the end of the day, all of this that's going on is not worth our souls. Amen? Would you pray with me tonight as we close? Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we don't even know how much longer the church will be able to publicly worship together. We have no idea how much longer... Uh, this is going to be able to be done. We don't know how many more Sundays we have left, how many Tuesdays we have left, but I am grateful that for the last 27 weeks, you have inspired our church to dive into learning about you because I believe that during the hardest persecutions and the most craziest things that could happen in our world, knowing who you are, knowing what you've done for us, knowing what you've prepared for us, knowing, Jesus, that you died for us is going to be the strength and the anchor that's going to help us during the most difficult times if we should live through this tribulation together. God, I thank you for preaching to every one of our hearts today. I pray that you would help us take inventory today of self-denial. 
I pray that you would help us really analyze how we're living our life and what our priorities are and, and who we are in you and our relationship with you. Help us, Lord, because we're going to need your strength. There's nothing easy about enduring persecution. We're going to need your endurance, Lord, because we don't know how long this is going to last. This may last six months, 12 months, 10 years. I don't know how long this is going to last, God, but I know this. We need your strength because the scripture says, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. God, I'm asking you for revelation tonight. I pray that you would help Give every one of your brothers and sisters, your saints of God, a fresh pair of eyes. Help them see their life for what it really is. Life is but a vapor. It's here one moment, gone the next. Help them see what really matters, their soul. Help them realize, Jesus, what's really important today. Give them the revelation to take a stand, to be Christians everywhere they go, to pay the price with self-denial, to have faith, O oh God. I pray that you help your people tonight, Jesus, because God, only you know what every one of our fears is in this room, Lord. But you said that we must pick up our cross and follow you. Lord Jesus, I pray for our mothers, our mothers that are afraid of their children, that they're afraid of what could happen to their children. God, I pray for strength for our mothers tonight. I pray for husbands that are afraid of what can happen to their wives. I pray for wives that are afraid of what could happen to their husbands. I, I pray for singles that don't know what to do if this starts unfolding. I, I, I pray for those that are afraid for their lost loved ones tonight, God. I, I, I'm praying, Jesus, that you would help us, God, because we need your help, Lord. We don't know what's coming down the pipeline, and we don't know when this is going to happen, but we know this much. We need you, Jesus. We need you working inside of us. We need your conviction. We need your spirit. We need your power. We need your anointing. We need your word. Help us tonight, Jesus, because I want to survive the end times. I want to make it to heaven. I want to make heaven my home. I want to be your son forever. Lord Jesus, I don't want to be destroyed. I don't want to go into the lake of fire. I don't want to, I, I, I would hate to see my name ripped out of the Lamb's book of life, God. There's, there's nothing that this world can offer me that's greater than the mansion you have for me. There's, there's no relationship more valuable than my relationship with you, God. This world, while it was beautiful when you made it, it's actually pretty ugly because of the sin we've allowed in it. And God, you've made us a new heaven and a new earth. And that's where I want to spend my life. And that's where I want to spend eternity. And that's who I want to be with forever. I'm looking for the day, oh God, when Sister Kim and Sister Christine and, and, and Sister Crystal's bodies, that, 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 that they no longer have disease inside of them. I, I'm looking for the day that we no longer have to bury good people like Brother Cecil. And, and, and baby Essie and, and Abigail and brother Tory, but that we get to walk on streets of gold with them. I'm looking for that day, God. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the day, God, that you show us what you made for us that love you, what you paid the price for on Calvary, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. I pray that you would put a hunger in the church. Amen. To pray, oh God. Put a hunger in us, Jesus, to fast. Put a hunger in us to lose whatever it takes in order to make it to heaven. God, I pray that you put a hunger in us for the word of God. Help us, Jesus, utilize the time that we have wisely, God. Don't let us waste the time we have right now. I thank you, Jesus, for the church. I'm grateful that we can gather today, but it may not always be like this, God. Oh, God, I thank you for good men, but God, I pray that they're ready should they have to lead their households on their own. I'm, I'm grateful for good women. Oh, but God, I pray they're ready for the day that they may be tested, God. I pray for our children today, Jesus, that through our action and our words and our faith that they too believe that we are a part of the greatest gift given to a mortal, that we're a part of the portal and the embassy that goes to heaven. Oh, Jesus, help us tonight, God, because our world is pressuring us. Our world is calling for us. Our world is testing us. Our world is watching us. Hallelujah. And we're called to be the light 
light of the earth. We're called to be the salt of the earth. Help us tonight, Jesus, because we cannot do it without you. You prophesied greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, O oh God. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would remove fear, hallelujah, from our atmosphere. I pray you cast out fear out of the mind of your people. Yes, there's something going out. There's something going on around there. But I still believe that the name of Jesus is more powerful than any virus. I still believe the name of Jesus has all power in heaven and earth. I still believe that Jesus is in control. The government's not in control. The Antichrist is not in control. The world's not in control. Jesus is still in control. Jesus is still king. This is still God's earth. The Bible says that the earth is his footstool. This is where God can put his foot on it. Hallelujah, Jesus. I still believe that God. I pray you remove the spirit of fear because you did not give us that God. You you gave us power and love and a sound mind, God. I'm not going to walk around afraid. I'm not going to walk around tiptoeing. I'm not going to walk around trying to live like the world. They can be afraid because they don't know you. They don't know what you can do. They don't know your power. They don't know your miracles. But we, the people of God, do. Help us tonight, Jesus, overcome these things because the Bible says that we must overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony God have your way with us Jesus let my life be a living sacrifice unto you I refuse to be conformed to this world amen but I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind I'm going to let the word of God tell me how I should live how I should behave and who I should be I'm not going to take orders from the world I'm under a heavenly kingdom with a heavenly domain and I serve but one king and his name is Jesus and I will bow my knees to nobody but Jesus because he's the only one that paid the price for me he's the only one that's worthy oh I wonder if you would slip up your hands today and surrender and let him know God not my will but thy will be done hallelujah I want to live in self-denial I want to live from faith to faith I want to live from victory to victory I want to be ready for my testing I want to be ready for my trials God I want to be strong enough when they come knocking on my door and ask me to deny your name I want to be strong enough God should I live through this if they offer me a mark I'm going to let them know hallelujah the only marks I believe in are the ones on your hands on the cross hallelujah I'm not going to take no mark because I didn't come here to go to hell I came here to go to heaven hallelujah I didn't repent to go back I repented to go up hallelujah Jesus looking forward to that day when I get to call you dad and see you face to face thank you Jesus for this invitation thank you for the strength that I feel in the Holy Ghost tonight bless your precious people oh God and continue to please strengthen Sister Kim and Sister Crystal and Sister Christine and Sister Julia and everyone that's having a physical ailment by the authority of your mighty name, Jesus. We pray that your goodness and your mercy would touch their bodies and that you would use them as, as a source of faith and encouragement to others. You can do it, Jesus. This is why we pray to you. I pray this tonight, O oh God, by the authority of your mighty name. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. It's just theory until it's tested. God help us be ready when it's tested. Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as sweet, but I prayed for you. Did your faith fail not? God, oh, I pray for our brothers and sisters tonight. God, I pray for our backsliders that, oh, they would come home soon before it's too late. They would seek the Lord while you may be found. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for your time with us today, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Vaccine party at my house tomorrow.